I really hope we'll keep this very casual. I'm, I'm going to show you some slides, some, um, just a few of the photographs from the book. But if you have any questions while I'm talking, don't hesitate to interrupt me because uh, I want uh, this to be a learning experience for everyone. Um, this is the book that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, is not just my book. I was the editor of the book. I wrote the introduction, the preface, and one chapter. But I had four other uh, authors who contributed greatly to it, and I'm going to talk about each of them tonight when we when, when we speak. Um, it was done. In 2008, we were planning the 50th anniversary of the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation, which was uh, going to be in 2023. So, in 2018, we decided what we're going to do is we celebrate 50 years, and we talked about maybe doing a new architecture book because there hadn't been one published um, for many years. In fact, the last one published was um, in the 1980s, and it was Mills Lane's Architecture of Georgia which stopped at 1860. Mills didn't think that anything built after 1860 was important. And he would tell you that if you were here. So. But, um, and it was, it was black and white, didn't have color photographs. And there was really nothing um, on modern architecture. There was, a, there was a good book about modern Atlanta, modern Atlanta architecture. But nothing to bring us up to date and to celebrate the really amazing diversity that we have in, in Georgia of, of architecture. And, um, and I knew that it was a diverse story, a story that was an interesting one. But I learned a lot during the project, of course, you always do. Um, we found, I found out that it's a much more complex and diverse one. It's the story of people from different ethnic groups, Methodists, Spanish Jews, Salzburgers, Quakers, all immigrating into Georgia, encountering a Native American population, and bringing with them enslaved Africans and constructing buildings and landscapes which incorporate all these different cultures and different uses. Although most buildings were constructed without the assistance of trained architects, Georgia also benefited from trained architects from the Northeast and from Europe in the antebellum period and continuing into the modern age. Our architecture also includes Native American sites, buildings designed by and for pioneering women, African Americans, and by visionary outsider artists. So I'm now going to just give you a little bit of the flavor of the book and just a few of the many buildings that are featured, and not buildings but uh, sites as well. Oh, the other yeah, I wanted to mention the other thing I wanted to mention is that we've also included um, landscape architecture and urban design in this book because we feel like that we really feel like that's just as important many many times as buildings and. Um, you're going to recognize one of um, those those landscapes, which is partially in Atlanta and partially in DeKalb County. So this is the cover of the book. This is uh, in Madison. This is uh, a house called Boxwood. This is, of course, uh, really George's gift to the world and probably uh, uh, the greatest work of architecture in the state, the one that's the most famous, I think, throughout the country, um, and it's the city plan of the, of the town of Savannah. This was uh, designed by James Oglethorpe when he came here in 1733. He had some notion of how he wanted to lay out the city. He didn't have much notion about the climate of Savannah because the first thing he did was cut down every tree that could have given them any shade whatsoever. But I suppose they, they needed the timber <coughs> And I'm told that they did the same thing in Williamsburg because they, they cut down the tree that was nearest to where they wanted to build because they didn't have a way to, to pull them over to the... Uh, so this is uh, the, the first uh, four squares of the city being laid out. Uh, Oglethorpe went on to personally lay out eight squares. Uh, they are noted because they have that central uh, park and park-like uh, space in the middle. They weren't all parks in the beginning. Some of them were places for uh, community uh, baking ovens, so you could bring your dough and bake bread in the middle of the square. Some of them were designed for uh, to drill troops because they were constantly afraid of being invaded by the Spanish. So, um, but as we know it today, this verdant, beautiful, gorgeous city of Savannah uh, was really attributable to this really amazing plan, which uh, you know, not only had these uh, Tithing lots where uh, 
houses were built, the trust lots where public buildings were to be built, but lanes, what he calls lanes, and if you go to Savannah today, you don't see any power lines because the power lines all run down the lanes. And so we can't give Oglethorpe credit for that. He probably didn't envision there were going to be power lines. Nonetheless, that's where they are. So our first chapter was written by Carl Gable. Uh, Carl is a, a lawyer, like I am, but a, a developed a great um, knowledge of colonial South Carolina history, of the history of Palladio building. He, he and his wife owned a Palladian building in Italy, and um, and he has uh, learned a lot about colonial Georgia as well. And in fact, I think his his uh, writing on colonial Georgia architecture is the best that's, that's been written by anyone. Um, so just a few of the buildings that are featured from Colonial Georgia. This is um, a, a house called Wild Heron. It's a low, really in reality, it's just a low country South Carolina cottage because it is on the northern side of Savannah. So it's thought that people from South Carolina came down to take advantage of cheap land and built this, uh, this low country cottage with that characteristic kickoff roof that's now been enclosed with uh, screens, of course. This is, um, I've never seen this building. It's on, it's behind a gate because it's on land owned by one of the paper companies. But this one is from 1755, which probably makes it the oldest uh, existing structure in Georgia. Carl documented um, with others, with help with others, that in uh, 1800, there were uh, 8,000 buildings in the state of Georgia in 1800, and there are about a little over a dozen today. This is also in the Savannah area. This is um, the Jerusalem Church of Ebenezer, which is, of course, just up the river as well, uh, near Savannah from 1769, built by Salzburgers, who were German immigrants who built the colonial German church here, which is still in use by a Lutheran congregation. Uh, and it, it, the those buildings are in beautiful condition, and they are open to the public. Several times a year, there are services held here. So uh, if you want to see this building, you need to go to one of those services, which is the only time I've ever seen the inside. This is uh, the Rock House from 1795. This one has just been dated with dendrochronology. Um, raise your hand if you know what dendrochronology is. You know, some of you out there will do. Thank you. Dendrochronology is a, a science that has just been developed probably in the last 40 years where you can cut a piece of wood and look at the tree ring and then compare those tree rings to weather uh, records and by, by seeing how wide the tree rings are, how narrow they are, determine what winters uh, have occurred in that history of rings. And they can date it from when it was last, when the last ring was when it was cut down, how they can date, date it. So this one, the date is from 1795. Uh, it's near Thompson, Georgia. It was built by Thomas Ainsley, a Quaker who moved in with the Quaker. Uh, community there outside of Augusta, building a house out of native stone in the Anglo-German tradition. Uh, Thomas Ainsley turns out to be a ancestor, direct ancestor of Jimmy Carter's, and uh, this building was first restored in the 19, late 1970s with money that Jimmy Carter got when he was president for the, for the bicentennial. I remember bicentennial was 1976. So, uh, it's now in not ruinous condition as a good roof, but it's been vandalized because it's just sitting out in the middle of a field. No use for it. So there needs to be an active use put into this building. And perhaps the one that's in the best condition um, of all is the John Berrien House in Savannah from 1795. This one is in fact a fusion of Georgian architecture, uh, which is named after when the Georges were on the throne of England, King George I, II, III, and IV. And uh, federal, which is named federal because this is when the federal government of the United States came into vogue in 1790. Um, so the, what you see on the second floor were those triple windows. Those were put in in 1810. Above that is from the 1790s. This, this was in ruinous condition while I was in Savannah. Uh, Historic Savannah Foundation acquired it, uh, put it up for sale, and finally, through a number of unsuccessful attempts, a direct ancestor of John Berry, a guy named Andrew Berry and Jones, bought it and has done a beautiful 
He's an investment banker from Wall Street and decided to move south. Just like his, his ancestor, John Berrien, lived in New Jersey. He was in the Continental Army, a major right under uh, George Washington. And Washington was so impressed with him after the war that he appointed him the keeper of the Port of Savannah. And uh, he moved to Savannah in 1790 to be the keeper of the Port of Savannah and built this wonderful house on Broughton Street. Okay, we're going to move to the antebellum era. And as the slide says, this was written by Joseph Smith. Joe Smith is a graduate of Duke University and um, Yale College of Architecture. He practices architecture in Madison and in Athens, but all over the state, all over the nation, really, he's gotten to be uh, such a great architect. Um, so he had, he's written this chapter, and he did such a great job on this that he's thinking about submitting a manuscript for a larger book just on Antebellum, Georgia. So be on the lookout for that too. Uh, there were several architectural styles really important in the uh, early uh, 19th century. Uh, this is Ware's Folly, and this is a federal style of architecture, which I mentioned. Um, the federal style of architecture was a reaction against the heaviness of the Georgian architecture. Uh, technology had developed into larger panes of glass. Um, you see the slenderness of these columns, um, the beautiful fretwork under the eave at the top of the right under the roof line, and um, lots of curves. Almost every federal building has those beautiful fan lights over the front door. So, that, so there are a lot of curves in federal architecture. And this one in Augusta, Ware's Folly, uh, by an unnamed architect, but it embodies a lot of those principles. Um, this was built for Nicholas Ware, and it is now operated by the Herbert Museum of Art. So this, this, is, this one's open to the public. Now, I, Forgot to mention, well, I'll mention it now. One of the other priorities for us in putting together what buildings were going to be in the book is that they all had to be existing buildings. So we didn't want any of those sad stories, you know, great building demolished 1895. Um, and also, that if possible, we wanted to have buildings that we knew were open to the public so that people would have an opportunity to explore these buildings for themselves. Also, a building open to the public and one of my favorites in the state is the William Scarborough House uh, from 1821. And this is a, one of those examples of, uh, of international architects coming into Georgia early on in the, in the uh, history of the state. Uh, from, this is William J. of Bath, England. Uh, his father was a, a Methodist minister, uh, actually persecuted in England because he was really an author. Uh, you know, a reformist from the uh, Church of England. Jay trained under Sir John Soane, who was the, the leading institutional architect in London uh, in the early 19th century. And he came to Savannah design, uh, depending on whose arguments you believe, six or seven really great buildings in Savannah. And fortunately, uh, three, maybe four still exist. There's some debate about whether he designed the houses now headquarters for the Girl Scouts of America. Uh, called the uh, uh, Jewett Gordon Low House, they call it now, who's the founder of the Girl Scouts. Uh, but this one is in the, uh, not, not the federal style, not in the Greek Revival style, uh, but in the uh, style of England at the time, from 1821. And then this is also in Madison. This is the first Presbyterian church from 1842. This is one of the buildings by an unknown architect. Um, and uh, could have come very well from pattern books. There are similar architectural details for commercial, for church buildings. And Asher Benjamins, he was a man who published uh, a pattern book <coughs> in the early 19th century. And uh, this is how most buildings, of course, in Georgia were designed at the period. They didn't have an architect. They worked with a builder. The builder had a book and he said, well, here's some designs you could choose from and you could choose your mantelpieces, you could choose your doors, whatever you wanted, you could choose the, you know, the exterior uh, features and uh, could sort of just design your own building from pictures from this book. And of course, we still have those today. Uh, so that Lytton puts out much the same sort of thing these days and, and other people. But this one is in really pristine condition too and it's still in active use. 
and this is Nutwood uh, from near LaGrange. One of these architects who came from the north, Colin Rogers, came down to Georgia to, because uh, he heard this colony was growing, uh, the state was growing, the Native Americans had been removed, people were flooding into the state. And uh, this one is in the style that is transitioned from federal and Greek revival. And it was built by a guy named Nutt, N-U-T-T. Uh, he moved from the house that later became a a, uh, Institute for the Insane, so it kept its name Nutwood um, <laughs> amongst locals. When I visited this house um, about 15 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that, I found out that it had, it had been a uh, stagecoach stop. And later on, as cars came in, it became a gas station. And in the side of this house is one of those pumps. It was one of those glass cylinders? which you saw in the early 20th century, so I, I hope it's still there to testify to the history of that, of that use as a gas station. Okay, so we're moving up to the Victorian era, and this is by Carmi Jones McDonald, my wife, who has left the practice of renegade from preservation to become a, a priest that was mentioned earlier by Marissa, uh, and she wrote the chapter on the Victorian era, and Carmi has two degrees from Savannah College of Art and Design, one in historic preservation, and uh, one in architectural history. Um, first building is the Edward Peters House uh, from 1883. This is Godfrey L. Norman, um, built in the Queen Anne style, uh, with this a lot of characteristics of that, the asymmetrical massing. You don't see the dedication to symmetry that you've seen in almost every building I've shown so far. Um, so a purposefully asymmetrical, uh, Mixing materials was a big uh, feature of Queen Anne style of architecture. So here you see brick and uh, shingles and Tudor, uh, the half timbered and gable end. So this is a real characteristic of, of not just Queen Anne, but almost all Victorian buildings. Uh, this one was, as y'all probably know, was threatened with demolition. Uh, almost most of its lot was taken by some apartments backyard, but thank goodness to Savannah College of Art and Design moving the campus to Atlanta that they totally rehabbed the building and did a beautiful job in 2007. Um, it um, is, the SCAD is now using it as a special events venue. Um, if you want to see it, I encourage you to knock on the door and tell them that your daughter is getting married. <laughs> yeah, probably let you in. Another interesting building um, is a Martin Luther King Jr. birth home in Savannah, uh, in Atlanta, of course, uh, on uh, Auburn Avenue. This is from 1895, and this is also in Queen Anne style. You know, you can see the big differences in complexity of this building and these. This, this is actually much, there's so many more Queen Anne buildings like this than there are like this, because Queen Anne became uh, the house of the middle class in the Victorian era. Um, the King family lived here from 1925 to 1941. Uh, of course, his father, Daddy King, had a church down the street. Uh, Dr. King had one later on, on that same street. Uh, and if you've ever doubted the power of architecture and its symbolic value, uh, this one testifies to that, because you'll probably remember about uh, six weeks ago, uh, someone tried to burn this And thank goodness, I think some tourists saw it happening and uh, went out and stomped it out, I think, and called the, called the fire department. Another building here in Atlanta is from 1881, so right around the same time. This is the home of Joel Chandler Harris. It's a hybrid of the Queen Anne style and the East Lake style. And the East Lake style was a much less popular style, but a very important one, and one that was much more informed by really uh, emerging art trends, uh, like more artistry in, in East Lake in the East Lake buildings. And so the handrail and the, uh, the balustrade and the, the spandrel decoration on the porch is all East Lake in inspiration. This one's also open to the public at the House Museum. I think, don't think every day now, but uh, maybe Henry knows. 
Do you know how it's open? Yeah, they're, they're definitely open on Saturday. Saturday. I don't know, I don't know the other day. <coughs> um, new website now. I think you know, Joel Chandler Harris is one of these people. I think people in Atlanta know a lot about him, thank goodness. Uh, he was the second or third most popular author in America in the 19, late 19th century. Of course, Mark Twain, I think, was the most popular. But he was a very, very, very popular author. And finally, Rhodes Hall, um, late Victorian. This is by Willis Denny from 1904. Um, it was originally part of a 114-acre estate. So Amos Rhodes, the founder of the Rhodes Furniture Company, owned all the land on Peachtree Street and had a wider lot, but it went all the way across Spring Street, across the connector to where Atlantic Station was today. So he had an enormous amount of property. Um, when he died uh, in 1929, um, he, his, he had willed it to the state of Georgia with a provision in the will that it had to be used for artistic or educational purposes not, it would go back to uh, the estate, and they could do what they wanted with it. But fortunately, the estate was patient because it was fell into disuse. It was vacant for many years. The Archives and History used it for uh, a while. I think for probably about 30 years they used it. And then they moved out to that uh, building that's now demolished, of course, uh, down where the new federal courthouse is. Um, but the, the Georgia Trust has been there since the 1990s, and just as, I, as was said in the introduction, have completed a, a beautiful restoration of the building. Um, this is in the Richardsonian revival style of architecture. Um, it's really a Romanesque revival building, but Henry Hobson Richardson, a very famous architect, one of the most famous architects in the country um, of Boston, brought the Romanesque into mod modern times, and it was very influential in courthouse buildings, big mansions like this. Uh, and he was a very influential architect in the country. Yes? Is it open to the public? It is. And it is open to the public uh, for special events, but it's now being opened every other Saturday in the morning, Saturday morning. It's not as hard to see the clock. Yes, it's open. Okay. This weekend. Okay, to the 20th century. Um, so, in my research, uh, looking for what was really the first really notable neoclassical building in the, the state, um, it surprised me because it was very obvious, a very famous building, uh, and that's our state capital. So, uh, you know, I'm showing you all these other buildings, you see the lack of uh, conformity to symmetry and no classical elements, much more freer style. Um, by the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century, people had gotten tired of all that filigree and especially the interior uh, decoration of the time, which was just so, so many patterns and so much um, going on there that there was a return to simplicity. And uh, this building really represents that. You see how classical it is. You've got all of the classical dedication to symmetry, um, Corinthian columns, a dome like the Pantheon in Rome, which influenced so many uh, civic buildings at the time. But this is really when uh, Georgia was starting to prosper after the Civil War. Uh, they moved the capital to Atlanta from Milledgeville after the Civil War. Does anybody know where this, the legislature met? from that period, from like 1866, 1867, to when this building was finished in 1889. They met in a, a hotel ballroom. They met in a Kimball House Hotel, kind of a famous Victorian brick pile downtown. That's where they met. They did not have any permanent meeting quarters. So um, they finally appropriated enough money um, to hire F.T. Burnham and W.G. Edbrook from Chicago to come down. They put in the appropriation to build this building that all of the materials in this new building had to come from the state of Georgia. So they were trying to build up the economy as they were trying to pay for the building. 
So when it came back for bid, I think they put, you know, it had to be milled out of George Marble, probably. Uh, who knows, but somewhere from Georgia. And um, came back for bid over budget, and the architect suggested that we substitute Indiana Limestone to bring it into budget. So that's what they did. So, so much, so much for politics. Uh, but it, it is a great, wonderful building. We're very lucky to have a capital with such such great beauty and, and that the legislature again had the wisdom to appropriate money and hire a good architectural firm to rehab it. So Florida and Sargent were in charge of this and they really just did a magnificent job. And if you dare to go up there when the legislature is in session, I encourage you to check it out. It's a beautiful building. Most people have never been in the building. This is the Alonzo Herndon House from 1910. Uh, attributed to Adrienne Herndon, his wife, who was an uh, interesting person. Now, she was a, a college, instructor, college instructor, an activist, and a professional actress. An activist, I said, an actress. And she is credited for with designing this building. It's in the neoclassical with Beaux-Arts style detailing. Uh, and the house was built almost entirely by African-American craftsmen from 1910. And this one is it is a house museum, and it has limited hours, but they do have a website, and you can go to this one, and it's really quite delightful. So I really encourage you to visit this sometime. Now we're getting into some pure colonial revival, and this is the James Dickey House on West Paces Ferry. Um, this is one of Neil Reed's uh, largest commissions. It's a huge building, and uh, I chose it not because it's my favorite building, because it, I think Neil Reed did a lot better buildings than this one, but it shows the pure inspiration for this building, which of course is Mount Vernon. I would say you could put, um, take a scan of Mount Vernon and blow it up on your copying machine and you would have the plan of the Dickey House. I don't remember, but it, it is, and it has a green, sort of green metal it is, yes, yeah, it is. Like Mount Vernon. Yes. Mm -hmm. really it doesn't have the uh, little cupola on top, like Mount Vernon does. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Neil Reed's partner, Philip Schutze, uh, really the, the leading architect of neoclassicism uh, and colonial revival in the, in the state, maybe in the South. His, his work is admired really all across the South. But in truth, every large city in the South had its colonial revival and neoclassical architects. Uh, Savannah had its own. Uh, my home city, Montgomery, Alabama, had a really great one. Um, but this is, I think, Shutsey was the best. He was not just an architect. He was an interior designer and landscape architect. So when you go to Swan House, you're seeing a total creation of one man's vision. He got, he did the landscape architecture, and it is so well integrated. You can see from this, this photograph, the, the fountain, the staircase, and the way the lot, lot slopes down. It's really, really quite something else. Right here in Decatur, uh, there are two buildings featured in the book. This is just one of them. And this is a house designed by Lila Ross Wilburn. You all familiar with Lila Ross Wilburn, I hope? Uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb uh, and say that there are more buildings in the state of Georgia, standing buildings, there's not a legal law school than any other architect. Because in 1914, she published a book called Southern Homes and Bungalows. And that house, that book was used by so many people, whether the, whether the owner, whether the people who were uh, commissioning the house had the book, or whether the, the builder had the book. Um, that varied from place to place, I'm sure, but um, in the in the Mac district here in Decatur, I think there are like 20 Little Ross Wilburn houses, and I think she she lived in the neighborhood herself. But they are all over the state. So uh, there is a book on her uh, that was published. I don't, unfortunately I don't have a copy in my library, but uh, she was really great, and she didn't just do. Uh, Craftsman houses. She went on to do early ranch houses. Types. So check her out. This is a really pretty one. One of my favorites. 
Okay. We are steaming along the 20th century now. Um, and the first building we're going to talk about is the Empire Building. And we're not quite done with Philip Sutton yet. Uh, this is from 1898 to 1901 by Bruce and Morgan. Bruce and Morgan is sort of a forgotten firm. I mean, that a lot of our architecture historians know about them. Um, they did more courthouses in the state of Georgia than any other firm. So they're, they're working all over the state. They did hotel buildings, courthouses. They did All Saints Episcopal Church, uh, which one of the members was one of the, either Bruce or Morgan, I can't remember which one, was a member of the church and donated the plan for All Saints. But this is the classic uh, Chicago style skyscraper. Uh, that Louis Sullivan developed. Louis Sullivan was the person pretty much who invented the skyscraper. Uh, and the technology had so much to do with that. You couldn't build a tall building uh, economically until the steel frame was developed. So after the steel frame was developed and no longer, you weren't depending on the masonry to hold the building up, the steel held it up and the masonry was just a skin it was a much lighter construction method and you can go much, much higher uh, without diminishing the floor space. If you, if you try to build a tall building with solid masonry, you have to start out with big blocks of masonry and you could get thinner as they go up or, or else it would collapse. So uh, you didn't want a small ground floor because that's where the, that's where you got the most rent is from your ground floor. So. Um, Louis Sullivan developed the skyscraper using steel frame. He also developed sort of the, the uh, recipe. And the recipe was, people aren't used to these modern buildings. Let's do something they recognize. And he said, well, the column capital is something everybody knows. So the, here what you see is this base on this building. That was like the base of the column base. The shaft of the column would be just repeating elements. So this long <coughs> vertical uh, part of the building. And then the top would be an ornamented cornice, which in this building is not as bold as some of them, but still that was supposed to be emblematic of the cap column capital. And uh, this was repeated over and over and over all over uh, America. And uh, what's interesting here is this is from 1898 to 1901, but the Citizens Bank um, wanted to modernize it. So they hired Philip Shutzey in 1929 and they peeled off that base. And Shutzi designed this base, and it's more like an Italian palazzo than it is what it, more of a Victorian feel that they had originally designed. And then he did the lobby. So that lobby, how many of y'all been in that? So it was old CNS Bank lobby, and it's unbelievably gorgeous. Exactly. It was unbelievable. So that was, they basically gutted the whole first two stories. 